still a few people joining. Great. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cheryl Thompson, and I am one of the two co-directors of the Institute for the Advancement of Women's Health. We are an institute, of, an institute, a learning center, and a nonprofit organization that focuses on evidence-based research and implementation of health improvement programs on a community level. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, and we hope that you will check us out and continue to join us for future programs, virtual, and soon in person on topics such as cardiovascular health, caregiving, menopause, other chronic conditions like diabetes, high cholesterol, overweight obesity, and other topics. This year, we have focused on self-measured blood pressure monitoring in an effort to better manage hypertension. And part of hypertension management includes medication adherence, regular physical activity, and of course, properly managed diet. So with the holidays coming, holiday parties, dinners, often overeating, this is an important topic. Emotional eating, addiction to quick fill foods, foods. This afternoon, we will be focusing on the diet portion of this equation. So this afternoon, I'm joined by an American University public health scholar who will introduce our presenter for the day. During the presentation, please feel free to use the chat function to drop questions that you may have throughout today's presentation. And we'll also leave some time near the end for um, Q&A. So Jessica? All right, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this month's Lunch and Learn series. Uh, my name is Tejas V. Hari Hearn, and I'm an undergraduate student at the American University's College of Arts and Sciences, um, where I'm pursuing a degree in public health as an accelerated three-year scholar and an undergraduate certificate in advanced leadership studies in the School of Public Affairs. Um, it's my great honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Ashley Gerhardt, our guest speaker for today. Um, she's an associate professor of psychology at the University of Michigan. Uh, she also earned her bachelor's in psychology at the University of Michigan and completed her doctorate at Yale University. During this, she started researching how certain food items can trigger an addictive process. She developed, developed the Yale Food Addiction Scale to operationalize addictive eating behaviors, which has been correlated with frequent binge eating episodes, increased chance of obesity, and more. Dr. Gerhardt has also published over 100 academic publications, and her research has been featured on ABC News, Good Morning America, Wall Street Journal, and more. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gerhardt to this virtual stage. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to share my screen to share some slides with you, but please don't hesitate to put information in the chat and I will try and take questions as we go and as well leave some time at the end. Um, I, if I'm missing a chat question or you know, depending on the flow, maybe we'll all do a couple slides and then take a couple questions. If I'm missing a burning one, feel free to unmute and you give me the heads up that there's some in there. Sometimes it can be hard to monitor everything at once. So I'm going to share my screen. Can you all see this picture of ice cream cones? Okay, excellent. So I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about food and your experience with food and the way that foods are engineered and designed much of the food in our society in a manner that makes it hard to eat them in moderation, even when we know they're damaging our health, that they just have this pull on us. I often like to start my talks by thinking about how we create addictive substances. Um, so we have you know, lots of addictive substances in our world. We have cigarettes, we have cocaine, and almost all of them are man-made. They're things we create. And so if we look at an example of um, a coca leaf, um, when you have the coca leaf in its pure form um, and you kind of chew it or suck on it, which is pretty common actually in Southern America. It helps people deal with high altitudes and kind of gives them a little bit of a buzz like a coffee or a tea break. People don't seem to really get addicted to this. They don't lose control. They don't have such strong cravings. But when we refine it and process it down, so the alkalines in the coca leaf are really potent. There's a high dose of them and they can be rapidly absorbed into our body. We create cocaine. And this becomes highly addictive 
and that people can start to really consume this in a way where it even can really ruin their life. But then we don't stop there and we process the cocaine even more. Um, we can make it into crack cocaine, which is very, and it can be much more inexpensive, is much more stable. And when it becomes more easily accessible and less expensive, you can see an addiction epidemic arise around this addictive substance. And we've done this time and time again. This is what we've done with cigarettes. This is what we do with alcoholic products. We take something that exists in nature, we refine it, we process it down in such a way where it can start to trigger the brain, trigger our psychology in a way that we lose control over our intake and we can't stop even if we know it's really hurting us. So when I think about this, I think of our current food environment and that, and you know, we were really designed to make sure we were getting enough calories. That was a huge threat to us for much of our human existence. We were worried about famine. We were worrying about starving to death. And so the reward centers of our brain really pay attention to really calorie dense ingredients like sugar and like fat. And they remember these and they react to these and they're like, oh, this was so good. But for much of human existence, the best we could do of getting a high sugar food was fruit, like a banana or some berries, they're high in sugar. Um, or to get fat, it would be in nuts or hunting down a buffalo to get some meat. This would give us the high calorie fat that we needed to survive. So our brains really are sensitive to these to make sure we're motivated to get them. But with our technology in the modern world, we've gotten really good at stripping out the sugars and the fats out of those real actual foods and putting them in these really potent and, and refined substances like sugar, like butter, like lard. And then now we've combined them into, you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of new novel ultra processed foods that are have unnaturally high levels of refined carbohydrates like sugars and fats all combined together with a bunch of flavor additives and enhancements. And we can eat them so fast. The things like the fiber and the water and the protein that we see in real food have been stripped out. So if we think about how long it takes us to eat a banana and get the sugar in a banana, if you compare that to how quickly you can, you know, shove a handful of jelly beans in your mouth, it's a really different substance. And since the 1980s, these ultra processed foods have just skyrocketed. They've now become the dominant source of calories in the modern food environment in the United States for adults, children and, children and teens. And people have generally a pretty good sense that things like Dr. Pepper and Snickers and potato chips aren't health foods and that they might be damaging their health and that they're contributing to diet related disease and they want to try and cut down on them. But many people find that even when they really are motivated to do so, that the pull, that the craving, that the reward hit these foods give make it really hard to pivot away. So I'm just see one thing in the chat. Oh, my current presentation is the current slide plus the next. Can I correct that? Let me see. Let's play around with that here. Let's figure out our, I'm gonna stop screen sharing for a moment. Let's try this one. All right, now is it the only, the one slide, the picture of just the, uh, just the, all the goodies yeah. on it? Okay, right. fabulous. Right. There's three screens going on right now. So I have to figure out which one I'm sharing with you all. So that's that one. Okay, so here's just like a little quiz just to kind of wake you up a, a little bit today. So take a look at this, take a moment. This is a food. It has over 30 ingredients, um, many of which even as a food scientist, I don't know what the heck they are. Um, so we have things like guar gum, we have things like dextrose, we have things like, um, strawberry puree concentrate and cellulose gel, plus our usual culprits like salt and sugar and uh, fructose, right? And so when you look at this, this sort of science experiment laundry list of huge chemical concoction of this industrial processed foods is now the major thing that we get. So does anyone wanna make a guess at what we would 
identify this food as if we were walking around the grocery store? What would maybe the front of this package look like? Anybody have any guesses they want to shout out or put in the chat? Granola bar. Well, very close. Uh, anybody else want to give it a try? You're in the right, you're in the right ballpark. Oatmeal. Oatmeal, very close. Uh, Tanya, do you have a guess? Not quite. But in, in that same in that same vein. We'll do one last guess. Cereal. It is a strawberry nutrigrain bar. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at this, one of the things I think is really tricky, it's a strawberry yogurt nutrigrain bar. And I know that if I was walking around the grocery store, I might not think of this. It's got strawberry in it, right? It's got yogurt. We might think of this as a food that's healthier for us, but really what it is, is it's an ultra processed food that has been refined to deliver this rapid dose of you know, sugar and flour, spike our blood sugar. It's got oil in it, it's got salt, it's got flavor enhancers. This is the sort of food that our brain just does not quite know how to handle. Our brain was never designed to, to manage that. And so um, the next thing that we kind of see is that like as these foods have started to really skyrocket in our society, the amount of sugar that we eat has gone through the roof. So sugar is a really cheap, easy thing to put in ultra processed foods, even ultra processed foods you might not think. Foods that are kind of savory, like a tomato sauce or ketchup, they often have a lot of added sugar into them as well. And what we see is that as these ultra processed foods really started to take off, um, you can see this graph that shows the daily caloric intake from sugar sweetened drinks that are ultra processed like Coca-Cola and Dr. Pepper has gone from about 70 calories a day to about 190 calories a day um, in 1990 to 2000. And one of the things that we know is that it really doesn't take that many extra calories on any given day. If every day you're eating about you know, 200 more calories than your body really needs, over time, your weight will start to creep up. Your risk for diabetes, for heart disease will start to creep up. And so just, you know, a little bit of this increased intake from sugar sweetened drinks shows us that this is a problem. If we look at taking an even longer time frame, if we look on the right there, we see that, you know, back in like the 1700s in the UK, sugar was so rare. The amount of sugar people were getting, it was almost considered a spice. It was really hard to get. And in about the 1800s, the amount of sugar that people started having access to and consuming started to go way up. And then again, in the 19, um, and like past like the 1970s, 1980s, we developed high fructose corn syrup, which is this processed version of sugar, which is really potent. It's more powerfully sweet than kind of table sugar. And that started to just kind of flood into all these ultra processed ingredients. So sugar is in so many of our foods that we're eating and we're not even aware of it. And the thing is sugar and fat and these other kind of flavor enhancers have really powerful impacts on the reward system of our brain. And so they go in when we eat it, the moment it hits our tongue, it activates this reward system in our brain. The taste buds go right up to what we call the ventral tegmental area in the, in the center of the brain, kind of that lizard part of our brain that we've had for so long. And it floods the brain with dopamine. And what dopamine does is it motivates you to want to seek more more and more and more. It kind of gets you ready to move. It can lead you to get kind of compulsive in your intake of it, where all of a sudden you're kind of shoveling it in your mouth and you know you should stop. And part of you wants to stop, but the drive for it is so strong. And you can get stuck and perseverated on that sort of behavior. This reward system is the exact same reward system that addictive drugs get in and activate and turn on. And so addictive drugs use this reward system that was developed to make sure we were getting enough calories and it's able to turn it into overdrive in a way that for some people, they start to use the addictive drug in a way that ruins their life, even though they really want to quit. What we're seeing is that these ultra processed foods that also have these really unnaturally high levels of reward in them due to their amped up levels of things like sugar and fat, that they can activate the brain as powerfully in many cases as something like nicotine or alcohol. And so for some people, these foods start to really grab you in this way where you're compulsively consuming them in a way that the reward system of your brain is driving you forward to want more, to eat more, to crave more, even if you know it's not great for you and part of you wants to cut down. 
And what we see is that over time, the more you're consuming these sorts of ultra processed foods, much like we see with addictive drugs, it actually starts to kind of rewire the brain and it changes the brain so that the density of reward transmitters that you have in the brain start to go down and down and down. And so all of a sudden you need more and more intense levels of reward to get the same experience of pleasure. So before maybe you could eat an apple and be like, oh, this is so tasty and delicious. Or you could have, you know, a really well, pe well seasoned chicken breast and that would be enjoyable. But the more you start to eat these unnaturally intensely highly rewarding foods, the evidence suggests that your brain is like, whoa, this is too much. And it starts to shut down the reward receptors of the brain. And so you become less sensitive to reward that isn't as potent and strong as this kind of drug, as this kind of ultra processed food. And so it keeps you kind of motivated and fixated on those sorts of unnaturally high rewards and struggling to motivate yourself to consume those more naturally occurring low level rewards. The good news is, is that the brain is plastic. And so as people shift away from the addictive drug, as people shift away from the ultra processed foods, if they're able to do that, there's evidence that the brain can start to heal itself and that the reward system can kind of come back online after a while and that you can get some of that pleasure experience back. But it kind of takes, can for some people can really take really kind of shifting away from that unnaturally intense and rewarding su substance. So what we see is that we have found in our lab this idea that just like with cigarettes and alcohol that can kind of trigger this addictive response, you know, not everyone who uses cigarettes, not everyone who uses alcohol goes on to develop kind of a, a full-blown addiction to them. You know, about 90% of people drink alcohol in their lifetime, about 15% of people actually develop kind of an addictive response to alcohol. And so we have certain diagnostic criteria, certain um, indicators that we use to try and identify, okay, who's just kind of a drinker, a social drinker, and who's really starting to show an addiction. And so some of the criteria we look at is that you lose control over your intake. You can't stop even though you really want to. It kind of feels like it takes on a life of its own. You have these really intense cravings where it almost feels like you can't focus on anything other than that food or the substance. You're prone to relapse, that even if you can cut down for a little bit, you just find that it's hard to stick with it and you kind of keep going back to the drug, even if you have, or the food, even if you have like small moments of success. You can show tolerance where you need more and more of the food or you need more and more intensely rewarding versions of the food to get that same effect. You can go through withdrawal that when you try and cut down on the, on the substance, you feel irritable, you feel agitated, you have headaches, you feel edgy, and that makes it hard to maintain quitting. And that even if you're having negative consequences, even if you know your health is suffering or your mental health is suffering because of your intake of the food or the addictive substance, you just find that you're unable to change your behavior. These are kind of the hallmarks that we see of what addiction presents at. And when we estimate what percentage of Americans meet this kind of diagnostic criteria for an addiction and their intake of these ultra processed foods, it's about 15% of Americans. That's really similar to what we see with other legal, easily accessible substances like alcohol, which it's you know, about 15%, cigarettes is about 18%. So we're seeing that this is really causing people to get addicted to all the classic hallmarks of addiction on par with what we see with other legal, easily accessible addictive substances. And so what does this mean? If people are showing more signs of addiction in their eating, what does this mean for them? Um, so we know that folks who are showing this addictive pull for the foods, that they are at greater risk for diet-related consequences. Obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, that this kind of pattern of being hooked on these foods impacts their health. We see that many of the psychological mechanisms that are implicated in other addictive disorders are also maintaining this kind of pull towards the food. So we'll see for folks things like depression, um, that can really lead people to be more vulnerable to using the food as a way to kind of cope with their mo mood, to regulate. Um, we see that things like having trauma in your history can increase your stress and make you more prone to experience an addiction to these foods. 
And that if you have a family history of addiction, if you had parents or grandparents who themselves really struggled with either kind of an addictive response to these foods or struggled with things like alcohol or tobacco or cannabis, that that is a potential risk factor for being more vulnerable to the addictive impact of these foods. We also see that there's biological mechanisms at play. So when we look at individuals who have um, who have this more addictive eating, it seems like their dopamine system, that reward system that plays a big role in substance addiction also seems to be not performing optimally. And I'll give you an example of that. So a little bit of what we see when we look at food addiction and drug addictions generally is that the cues become so powerful. The cue that tells you that your substance is available starts to become so salient and so motivating and it starts to drive the use. And so, for example, if somebody who's struggling with alcohol goes past their bar where they always used to drink, all of a sudden that location just starts to act their, activate the reward center of their brain, and they start craving that alcohol really intensely. And we're seeing evidence that this is also true with food, that you see the golden arches, and all of a sudden, all you can think about are the McDonald's french fries, or you walk by that vending machine where you usually get your 3 p.m. hit of kind of a, uh, you know, your chocolate fix, that just seeing that cue starts to activate the brain. So we took people into a brain scanner where we were able to see what their brain was doing, and we showed them either a picture of a chocolate milkshake or a glass of water. And then in the scanner, we gave them either a delivery of a haagen chocolate milkshake or this kind of tasteless solution that doesn't taste like anything. And we did this repeatedly in the scanner. And what we found was that people who showed more signs of addictive eating that when they saw that milkshake cue compared to that water cue, their reward system of their brain was activating. It was showing up in these regions that make you crave, that make you desire, that really makes you wanna seek out and get that substance. That for those folks who were showing more addictive eating, they were more vulnerable to that milkshake cue and that that was getting their reward system primed and ready to go. But then when we looked at our food addiction group, when they were actually consuming the milkshake in the scanner, what we saw for them is that the breaks in the brain, this is the um, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain that kind of helps you inhibit and say, oh, I've had enough. I've had you know, a handful of potato chips, I'm good, I can stop. Or I've had two drinks, I'm done for the night. That part of the brain that's implicated in being able to put on the brakes, it's not working as well once you start consuming. And so what we're getting is kind of this one-two punch where people are seeing the cues, which are everywhere in our environment. Our environment is drenched in the cues for these ultra-processed foods. Like you go to check out of the gas station, they're everywhere, right? You go to like pick up a stapler at, you know, Staples, and there's just junk food on your way out. And you go to your morning meeting and somebody's brought donuts. Like these cues are there all the time. And so your brain is getting flooded with this. I want, I desire, I crave when you're seeing these cues and even more so if you're vulnerable to this addictive process. And then when you try and just have the one cookie or you try and have just that handful of potato chips, being able to put on the brakes and stop yourself, it just doesn't seem to be working quite as well. But we see that this really isn't the case with all foods. Like if we put people um, with a bowl full of salad or a, you know, a bowl full of strawberries in front of them, people don't seem to kind of lose control and struggle with these foods in the same way. Instead, we really think that it's not about all food. It's, you know, we say food addiction, it's a huge misnomer. It's really about these processed foods that we think have been altered much in the way that addictive drugs have, where they have these increased doses of rewarding ingredients and they have this rapid rate of absorption where your body just gets hit with a flood of sugar, a flood of fat really fast because so many of our processed foods have been broken down and they, they have texturizers put in them. So they melt in your mouth as soon as you eat them. And they're really easy to just shovel in as rapidly as possible. They're almost kind of pre-chewed. So you eat much more rapidly. And then when they hit your gut, there isn't as much fiber and water and protein to slow down the absorption into your gut, into your bloodstream and into the brain. So I have a student who's really worked on this to say, are these the sorts of foods that when we just ask people, okay, here's the signs of kind of addiction, what foods are you most prone to experience this with? 
these are some of the top culprits. And I don't think this will be a shock to any of you. You know, when we get this, it's like, of course, chocolate, ice cream, French fries, pizza, cookies, chips, you know, all these foods that are typically processed, they have high levels of sugars and flours, fats, often salt and other flavor enhancers. These are the sorts of foods that when people sit down to eat them, they struggle. In contrast, when we ask like, what foods are the ones that you, you know, don't struggle with, they're all minimally processed foods. They're foods that exist in nature. They're foods that nourish us. Apples and salmon and bananas and cucumbers, these are foods that people don't lose control over. They're also the sorts of foods that our brains evolved to be able to handle. And they're also foods that are naturally high, many of them, and things like sugar, like an apple or a banana, or naturally high in fat, like salmon, but that in these natural process, in these natural foods that come combined with fiber and water and protein and are nourishing, people don't lose control over them. And so we are really thinking about this a lot that it, you know, it's about your individual risk factors, but it's also really about the foods themselves and how they're engineered and designed to hit you. And I think the hard thing is, is that with most addictive drugs, you, you don't get exposed to them when you're little, right? You're, you people start experimenting with alcohol and cigarettes and cannabis and kind of adolescence and you know early adulthood is generally the time period people will first try those sorts of substances. In contrast, you know, we are typically getting exposed to these ultra processed foods in the womb. Um, by the time a child is two years old, they're more likely, um, half of their diet is ultra processed food. They're more likely to be having an ultra processed food on any given day than they are a fruit or a vegetable. And so we kind of look at this advertisement that's this, uh, this mocked up Heineken advertisement that says, you know, why we have the youngest customers in the business. You know, this baby's 11 months old and he isn't even our youngest customer. You know, they love the, our, our substances. Babies feel good after they consume them. Put a little bit in your milk, moms. It'll make them feel better. And this feels outrageous if we think about if somebody of Heineken was actually trying to market to babies and to kids. But this actually is a real 7-Up ad that used to exist. And somebody just went in and Photoshopped Heineken onto it. It. So when we we know that we have been targeted from our earliest years to develop strong, positive associations with these sorts of ultra processed foods, they're what we get as a reward. And it's what we get for our birthdays. You know, they're things that as kids, we're consuming a lot of. And when we're children, our brains are also more vulnerable to the negative impacts of addictive substances. And so like the, we don't really even know, we can't really conceptualize what is the impact of kids getting half of their diet from these ultra processed foods, because they used to be a special treat, right? You used to have like cake on a birthday or, you know, something special on a holiday. Now these sorts of foods are the majority of the diet that we're consuming. And the concerning thing is that we see like even when we look at little kids who are, you know, as young as six, seven, eight years old, we're seeing that about 7% of them meet that clinical threshold for food addiction, that they're showing like a full-blown addiction profile in little kids with these foods, that the average child is showing two symptoms of addiction and in their intake of these highly processed foods. And that the kids who show the most of this addiction profile, they have a higher body mass index, they have more emotional overeating where the emotions, the drive to regulate emotion is more important in driving when and how or what they eat. They're less responsive to satiety signaling that tells them they're actually full and they don't need more calories. And overall, they consume more calories when we bring them into the lab. And so for me, this is one of the most um, concerning things. It's like, when we talk to folks who say, man, I really, I feel addicted to these foods, they often can point back to their childhood and say, I was already starting to show some signs of this when I was a little kid, that these foods just had such a pull for me or such a crave, right? Sneak them, right? Hide them in my room, right? Overeat them, even as a little kid. And we know that, you know, preventing these sorts of, preventing a, an addictive relationship with a substance is way more effective than trying to treat it once it's already established. But given that we're getting exposed to these foods and this is happening so early and so young in this food environment, we really have to think about how are we setting up this next generation um, for their relationship with food for their health. Um, and so then I kind of go a little bit to what happens. So if you're saying, okay, like I, I feel, I know this, these foods are struggling, I'm gonna switch to this minimally processed food diet. 
you know, what we'll see with things like cigarettes is that people will go through withdrawal, especially in the first week or two after they try and switch or cut down. And we see that this is really associated with symptoms like feeling anxious, feeling restless, feeling irritable, feeling down, not being able to concentrate, things like headaches or, you know, nausea. And that this is, these are some of the factors that can show up. And so we've been trying to ask ourselves, like, do people show this when it comes to trying to cut down on their food. And what we found is that, let me check one thing real quick. Okay, so what we see is that yes, that people are reporting to us that when they try and cut down on these highly processed foods and shift to this more minimally processed food diet, that they show these same kind of symptoms of irritability and anxiety and headaches and depression and these intense cravings particularly in that first week when they're cutting down. And then if you can stick with it after two weeks, it starts to become less intense. And that the longer you stick with it, the more that kind of those emotional and physical symptoms really seem to fade away. And that what we know right now is that we're not addressing this at all when we're trying to help people eat healthier. We're not preparing them for this. And But with things like cigarettes, we'll kind of help people, okay, there's going to be this withdrawal syndrome and we have medications for it and we help them have emotion regulation tools and we help let them know that if they can just stick with cutting down on the cigarettes, it's going to get better over time. I think right now, you know, we're not preparing people with this information so they know what they're getting into and they know this isn't going to last forever and that they have some tools on hand to help. Um, so that's something that, you know, we're thinking about a lot. And then when we think about, you know, what are some of the mechanisms that are playing a role that we have targeted in treatments when it comes to other addictive disorders, you know, we think that many of them are really very important in the context of these foods. And so emotion dysregulation, feeling like you can't get a handle on your emotions, your emotions feel out of control, and that you're using the substance, whether it's food or the cigarette or the addictive substance, to regulate your emotion is key. So for a lot of people, there's treatments um, like dialectical behavioral therapy that helps you identify your emotions, regulate your emotions, develop better ways to feel like you're more in charge of your own emotional life rather than relying on substances to cope. We have people focus a lot on identifying what are your cues and what are your triggers in your environment. And we'll actually have people journal a lot and just spend a day, you know, oh, I felt triggered, triggered here. And it was because I was with this person or I saw this advertisement or I walked past this location that I know has this food or I was feeling this emotion. Equipping yourself with the knowledge of what are the cues and the triggers helps you be prepared. But then you can also think about are there things in your environment that you can or that you're in control of that you can remove. So for some people, well, we will suggest that there's certain foods that are just so powerful for you that at least while you're trying to get a handle on this, that you do get them out of your house and that you do have lots of accessible, minimally processed foods that you enjoy that are tasty on hand, already prepped, already ready to go. Well, talk with folks about craving. Craving is one of those big triggers for kind of going back to you know, overeating. And so one of the things we do um, is, again, identify the things that might be most likely to trigger a craving, but we help people try and surf the urge. We know craving is going to go up and it won't last forever. And so if you can kind of surf the craving and just kind of notice it mindfully, and then you're going to watch it kind of crest, and then you can surf down that wave that that is something that's helpful in substance addictions and with eating. We can help people focus on inhibitory control training. So what are strategies that you can do to kind of focus your mind, like deep breathing, or really kind of focusing on your long-term goals that can help you inhibit your desires? For a lot of folks, we suggest the need to maybe get other issues treated, like getting mood disorders treated, getting trauma treated. That can really help people then be more successful um, at the same time that they're trying to change their habit around addictive substances. And we see that often there's a lot of ambivalence for folks, right? They want to change. They want to, you know, eat better or they want to you know, stop smoking but also that gives them some pleasure and it's something they've done for a long time or it's what they do socially. And so we have this strategy called motivational interviewing where we help people really hone in on what is their own personal motivations and desires 
um, to change. And we acknowledge that there's some parts of you that don't want to change, that there's some parts of you that you know, wants to stick with the status quo and that you kind of have to hold those and respect that and know that's going to be there. And that doesn't mean you're going to fail, but you want to kind of really have at the front of the mind, why are you changing? Why is this worth the hard work for you? Is it about your health? Is it about being around for your grandkids? Is it about having more energy? Why is this important to you? So just a few things to help you kind of think about what can you do for yourself is, you know, planning for withdrawal. If you know you're going to make a shift, you might prepare yourself to think about what are some ways you're going to take care of yourself in those first week or two when things might be really hard. You know, how you are, can you have some social support on hand? Can you have some strategies on hand? Um, making sure you have nutritious foods that you enjoy around and easy is key, knowing your triggers, know, you know, know thyself, right? That can give a lot of power, monitoring that, journaling that, jotting down for yourself, anything that you realize is a big trigger helps you plan ahead and be prepared. So you don't kind of feel like it hits you out of the blue. Planning ahead is key. You know, one of the things that's so tricky about these foods is they're convenient and they're accessible and they're in our face. And so kind of having to plan ahead to know, you know, you kind of do have to know what are the foods, the nutritious, minimally processed foods that I'm going to turn to instead. How do you have those on hand? How do you plan to have, a, you know, a bag of almonds in your bag? How do you make sure you have a bowl of grapes in your fridge? How do you kind of set yourself up? Because when you're in those hot moments where you're upset or you're craving and you're hungry and you just want it so bad, then trying to be like, okay, and now I have to stop and I have to cut up this apple and I have to drive to the grocery store and prep the salad. It's too hard. You have to make it as convenient as possible for yourself ahead of time. Working on your stress management, you know, ways that you can kind of help yourself not feel so stressed will reduce vulnerability. A big part of that is hunger. You know, one of the big things that I see for folks is that they will really say, okay, I'm going to change my diet. And then they don't get enough calories that they're like trying to just eat a 1200 calorie a day kale only diet. And then your brain is so hungry and it makes you more vulnerable to stress. And it makes the reward system of your brain even more reactive to those food cues. So I really encourage people, make sure you're eating three meals, one or two, two snacks a day. Make sure you're getting real high quality nourishing food. You're getting a high level of protein. Protein really helps you feel Feel satiated, making sure you're getting food, real foods that have fiber in them, making sure you're eating regularly. So you're stabilizing that blood sugar. So you're not having these spikes and crashes are going to be key. Again, controlling your environment where you can, if there's certain foods that just every time you have it in the house, you just eat the whole bag and you're at war with yourself of like, okay, I had a little bit of the cake, but you know, that sliver of cake now it looks a little off. I need another sliver of cake. And then the next thing you know, you've eaten the whole cake. As much as you can, setting up your own personal environment that you're in control of, where you're not having those triggers, where you're constantly at war with yourself is helpful. Exercise you know, is great for emotion regulation, for actually building up the reward system so it heals, for encouraging better inhibitory control exercise, distracting yourself, getting outdoors when you're in a heightened craving state for food and just saying, I'm just going to go walk on outside for 10 minutes. Often that alone can help you help you surf that craving, help it go down, distract yourself. It doesn't have to be huge exercise. Walking around the block for even a little bit can really be a tool that can be beneficial and helpful. And again, folks will often ask me about dieting. And I really think of this as something that you really have to approach it more as like a lifestyle change, like really crash diets. You know, people can stick to that for a little bit. Focusing on what is achievable in your life and what can you maintain and not thinking about it as like a short moment in time, but nourishing your body and in a way that's sustainable is I often think for many folks, the key to success and crash dieting kind of sets you up on this yo-yo cycle, um, which is hard to maintain. I'm happy to talk about that more. And I encourage you to just think about, you know, the food that like everybody's individual, everybody has their personal foods that are more or less likely to trigger them. Generally in our research, we feel that, see that overall real food, fruits, veggies, legumes, foods that don't have, you know, 30 ingredients on their list. These are foods often that people don't struggle with as much. And so making that the base of your diet, but ones you like, you're not going to live on this if it if you hate it and it tastes like gruel, right? Like you need to investigate different sorts of real food that you enjoy 
we often see that people kind of have a moderate risk profile. It's really individual about how they feel about real foods, but that are fatty and often can have salt associated with cheese or steak or bacon. These are foods that some people really struggle with losing control over, others don't as much. And then in the high risk, you know, we see a lot of those foods that have sugars and processed flours and fats and that, that you know, have those long ingredient lists. These are the foods that people struggle with. And some suggest we shouldn't even call these foods, right? They are processed substances that have been engineered to hit your bliss point, to make it hard for you to listen to your body, because the more of them you eat, the more money people make. And so, you know, acknowledging that, and that's hard, you're going against the trillion dollar industry that's engineered these foods to make it craveable and, you know, just to make it, you know, once you pop, you can't stop, right? They know this, but knowing that the food itself comes with some risk can help you think about what do you want the quality of your diet to be about? And I particularly suggest to folks, you don't want to eat a high risk food for you in those high risk triggering situations. So if you find that boredom or being really hungry or you know getting in a fight with your partner just triggers you to wanna to eat, to deal, that is not the time to try and eat the ice cream sundae, we find. And so it doesn't mean you can't not, you, you know, I'm not saying abstinence only, I'm not saying like you can only eat minimally processed foods, but I think we can think flexibly about how can you eat them in a way that reduces harm while acknowledging that they do have this high reward potential and making most of your diet nourish you with foods that you aren't in a psychological battle with trying to not overeat. So um, thank you so much for uh, listening to me. I'm just going to quickly, these are just uh, funders and folks that have helped me, but I, I wanted to put up here my lab website. Um, so you can go, you know, that lab website might be a little out of date. I'll, I'll send you guys the updated one. Um, but if you Google my name, Ashley Gerhard, it'll pop up a link to my lab and you can see other presentations and tools and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the food addiction scale is on there as well. Okay. Thank you, Great. Dr. Gerhardt. There are some questions that came in during registration. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see you better. Yeah, there's yeah. some questions that did come in during registration. Sure. Let's talk about them. Covered a lot of this, but I'm going to go ahead and um, start with them. Um, one that you probably didn't cover is: Does blood type have anything to do with diet requirements? You know, that is one that I would say the research is still out on. Um, what I will tell you is that with these ultra processed foods, your blood type probably won't protect you. Do you know what I mean? So it might make you more vulnerable. We don't totally know. There's some evidence that AB blood types might be more prone to at least the health damaging effects of these foods than O blood types. Um, but that there is, when it comes to the reward pull of these foods, being an O blood type won't necessarily protect you from the unnaturally heightened pull of these foods. Okay. Um, can you address whole food, plant-based eating? Mm. You yes. talk a little bit about the whole foods. Absolutely. So I think whole foods is a great way. As much as you're eating a whole food that like your grandma would have recognized and be like, I know what this is. I look at this ingredient list. I can pronounce everything on this list. That, that you're probably in better shape. I worry a little bit that sometimes people will look at plant-based eating and they will chalk their diet full of ultra processed, like vegan or vegetarian foods, like, you know, Oreos, a vegan food, right? But those foods still have the sugars and you can have, you know, canola oil in it that's vegetarian or vegan that has as much in and artificial sweeteners too we know also really highly activate the brain so i generally for folks and again it's individual for everybody right there is no one size fits all so you really need to ask yourself how this fits with your life but the more you can have real recognizable food whole food in your life the better if you are on a vegetarian or vegan diet or just you know no no meat or no dairy or less of that you really need to make sure you're getting enough protein and that i would even suggest speaking to a dietitian because we know protein plays a big role in satiety and that you have to be really mindful to make sure you're getting those protein levels um, so you're not always kind of hungry and your brain isn't always primed to overeat great um, sometimes age is an issue with um, management of weight and um, things like that. 
So a question came in, I'm 50, about to be 51. How do I overcome this and lose weight for good? Such a good question. So yes, first, you're right. Like, well, there actually, there's a big study that just came out that maybe our metabolism doesn't slow as much as we think till we're in our 70s. Um, what they think is like kind of when you're an adolescent or early adult, um, both your metabolism is a little higher, but often we're also more active um, as well. But hormones, um, especially for women, seem to maybe play an underestimated role and that you maybe stuff you could have eaten in the past, all of a sudden your body grabs it. If you're going through hormonal shifts, let's say pre-menopause, your body will maybe take that food and all of a sudden it stores it as fat. And you're like, what? I used to eat this at this level and now my body's changing. Um, so again, I think I would propose to you, and this isn't, I, I, I that you pay attention. I would, I would try not to obsess about a number on a scale. Like that we do, we can see that there is some body shifts, right? That you may not be at the level you were at high school. You want to focus on, I would say, what you control more. We know that once the body, once you have gained a lot of weight, when you try and lose that weight, your body fights you against it. And it will slow its metabolism sometimes. And it will try and maintain that diet. It will burn less during exercise. Here's a couple of things I can tell you. We see that when people are eating real whole, minimally processed foods, the hunger and satiety hormones in our body work better. And they tell you more effectively when you are full and that you will kind of, we've seen even naturally that when people are shifted to a minimally processed diet, they will eat 500 less calories a day without even knowing it. And so I think focusing on the health behaviors that you can control more, you, you don't have full control over whether your body's going to shed that weight or not. The good news is if you really focus, and sometimes that makes you feel worse and makes you feel, hate yourself more and feel depressed and agitated. And, and then those emotions lead you to eat more and it's a vicious cycle. I would propose to you that while it's good to have a sense of your weight, other health behaviors can be just as important and shifting to a uh, more high quality diet, trying to build in even low, low impact exercise can have such an impact on your longevity and your mental well being that I would focus as much as you can on that. That's hard. Our society tells us to obsess about what is our size and what is on the scale. I would just encourage you to try and focus on the health behaviors as a start, but be compassionate with yourself that it's hard to do that in our society. Okay. We have a question that just came in in the okay. chat. Um, we have time for just a few more because we sure. are going to end on time. <laughs> Got you. Okay. So the question is, I, I had a total thyroidectomy last year. Mm. Do studies show any connection between thyroid removal and changes in eating habits? and the body's response to food? Oh, this is such a good question. And one I don't have deep expertise on. So I will tell you what I know is that yes, the thyroid definitely has an impact and on both drive for food and the way that your body stores the food, those like hormones that are going on. And that having that, your thyroid function, whether it's a thyroid removal or hypo, like we typically see with hypothyroidism that people will start to gain weight and they'll have more craving, especially for carby sort of foods and that their body stores that food more. And that hyperthyroidism, which has a host of other negative effects, people almost feel less hungry. So when the thyroid's overactive, but it has a bunch of other negative effects. With folks who are struggling and they just feel like their appetite and the drive for food is so strong, I do often suggest that they meet with their primary care physician to get a full workup. If you're pre-diabetic or diabetic and it's untreated and you're, or you're, you're um, at a stage of also like menopause where your hormones are really shifting or you're having issues with your thyroid, there's ways that we can um, get in there to impact our, our physical health and the way our body is functioning in a way that will make us less vulnerable to the highly rewarding impact of these foods. And if those physiological symptoms aren't working optimally, they often go and they communicate to the reward center of the brain. So if you are having these blood sugar spikes and crashes because you're an undiagnosed, untreated diabetic, it is going to make your reward system of your brain be totally haywire for these foods. And so getting diabetes under control a little bit with some medications or things like that might then also help you have um, a better chance regulating yourself around those foods. So primary care physician, making sure that 
as much as you can, the thyroid, getting your thyroid optimized after having the thyroid removed and whatever way your doctor suggests would probably help. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, one last question. Is panko a healthy replacement for flour? Do you know? Great that? question. So panko, so I would suggest that people think of harm reduction. I think we talk about food in a dichotomy. Like this is uh, totally healthy and anything that pivots from fruit and veggie is, you know, everything, it's all or nothing. And I would say it's along a dimension, right? And so at the far, far end, you know, we might have like the super breaded fried KFC chicken with all the additives and all the stuff. And let's say, you know, you're like, oh, it's a grilled chicken breast. It just doesn't do it for me. And I'm going to use like lightly breaded panko instead of kind of a deep fried coated chicken. Fab. That is a step, like that is a less harmful option. And if it makes you feel more satisfied and it's sustainable for you in a way that maybe just a purely grilled chicken isn't, um, think about, I would encourage you to think about how that fits in your diet. The goal is not to be perfect. The goal is not black or white. It is about reducing the harm as much as you can and figuring out what is sustainable for you so you don't feel constantly deprived. Um, so I definitely use panko in my cooking. I do think of it as something like not quite as healthy as the just purely grilled chicken, but for me, it gives that little bit of crunch and is different than like a super fried, super floury coated um, chicken. That's a great, that, yeah, that's a great note to, to end on. Cool. Not to be perfect, but always improving. Yeah, yeah. Where are the spots that are maybe starting at the top? Like this is the spot where the, I eat that one bag of potato chips every night when I get into my couch. Even making those small, like, okay, I'm going to get the potato chips out of the house and I'm going to try and pivot to something else in that moment that's maybe less harmful and I'm not losing control over as much. Great. You know, be your human. Our brains want food. They want calories. There's trillion dollar industry that's making it hard to eat in moderation. Treat yourself with some kindness and compassion. This isn't easy. And with that, thank you so much, Dr. My Mayer. pleasure. So happy to speak with you all. Um, don't hesitate to reach out um, as well. And, and I'll send you my um, the updated lab website and feel free to share any contact information of mine. Yes. And if you have any other links on studies that might be helpful, we'll take them. <laughs> that sounds great. So lovely thank to talk so to you all. I wish you all the best. Thank you for thank listening you. to me today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. Thank you.